Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. MashaAllah, what, what a crowd. Alhamdulillah, this is seriously the most amazing problem to have. I wish every masjid was like this too, right? In every convention, in every class. MashaAllah, Allah mazid wa barak. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear brothers and sisters, the hadith that I'm about to share with you contradicts absolutely everything you've heard so far in this convention. I was sitting here last night and I was listening to Sheikh Abdul Rahman Khan talk about how Nothing contributes to happiness that is material in its nature. And I'm going to share with you a hadith that conflicts with all of that. It literally refutes everything that you've heard for this entire convention when it's not explained properly. In an authentic hadith by Abu Harith, the Prophet وسلم, he says, There are four components of happiness. You ready for this? He said, A good spouse. Having a good companion is a component of happiness. He said, al jaru salih having a good neighbor is a component of happiness. So those are kind of understandable because then you have people, right? A good wife, a good husband, a good spouse, a good neighbor. Then he says, al maskanul wasir, having a big house. And then he said, al markabul hani. The literal translation of al markabul hani, and you've got Mr. Arabic here. Literally, it translates into a sweet ride, doesn't it? Literally, Markabul Hani means a sweet ride. And Rasulullah said, Wa min And there are four components of misery a bad spouse, a bad neighbor, Al Maskan Al Dayyiq, a very constricting small home, and the Prophet said, A bad ride. Now, what is amazing about this hadith, number one, is that the Prophet ﷺ just acknowledged that these things contribute to a person's happiness. These are components of happiness. There's no doubt about it. But here's the question. From those four things, what did the Prophet ﷺ have? Just number one, <laughs> a good wife. The Prophet ﷺ did not have a good neighbor. The Prophet ﷺ did not have a big house. His hujra, his apartments, his chambers alayhi salatu wasalam were nine by four. They were so small that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam used to tap the legs of Aisha radiallahu anha whenever he would make sujood. Did the Prophet sallallahu have a sweet ride? No. The Prophet sallallahu never rode a good camel or a good horse. In fact, his, his, his saddle was described as being worn out. So what is the Prophet sallallahu telling us? You know, he's telling us that, you know what? If you have a car that doesn't break down every five minutes, you're more likely to have a good day than someone who does. Having a good, nice space to live in, having that space can be good. It can contribute to your happiness as opposed to living in a very small place. Having a good spouse can certainly contribute to a person's happiness. Having a good neighbor can certainly contribute to a person's happiness. But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ himself does not have, except for one of those things, shows you what? Your happiness cannot depend upon those things. Your happiness cannot depend upon those things. Abdullah ibn Salam anhu, one time he walked into a masjid and the people saw him praying and there was this man who was from the tabi'een he never met abdullah ibn salam and the people were talking about how righteous this man was and how this is a man of jannah abdullah ibn salam the man who was a rabbi the chief of the rabbis before islam and this man sees him praying and the people see him praying and they're speaking well of him so this man goes up to him and he says to him i heard the people saying this and this and this about you what is it that's so special about you and Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, you know, subhanallah, it's not befitting for people to say that which they don't know. I'm not that good person that they were talking about. But what is it that they were talking about? He said, I once had a dream that I was in a garden of al-jinan, a garden of paradise. And in the middle of that garden was a pole. So he said, I walked in that garden of paradise to that pole, to that amud. 
And he said, as I got to that pole, I looked up and I noticed a handhold, a grip at the top of that pole. So I looked up at it and I was commanded to ascend to grab onto that handhold. And I thought, I said, how am I supposed to get all the way up there? And he said, and then an angel came from beneath me and blew until I ascended all the way up that pole and I grabbed onto that handhold. And he said, I woke up. And I told the Prophet the next day what I saw. And Rasulullah said, الروضة, as for the garden, Islam. That is the rawda, that is the garden of Islam. And as for the amud, as for the pole, that is the pole of Islam. And as for the handhold, that is al urwatul wuthqa, the trustworthy handhold that never breaks. That if a person grabs onto that handhold, they will never be grieved. They will never be taken away. They have entrusted their affairs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have meaning. They are grateful in their times of ease. They are patient in their times of hardship. They have meaning in their lives. And so as long as that handhold is not being sacrificed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never let it break and Allah will never let you go. As long as that handhold is still sturdy and it will always be sturdy, that person cannot be shaken. Because that person's purpose is stable, it's consistent. He has meaning in his life. And you know, James Baldwin, because religion always takes this beating, because if you, know, you go to any philosophy class, and really it's a war on religion, and a war on Islam specifically, but it's a war on religion in the field of academia, in all the circles of academia. History professors will say, religion is responsible for the world's violence, where religion is responsible for all of the hatred, religion is responsible for crime, religion is responsible for this, religion is responsible for that. Of course, ignoring that the Crusades were because of an econo the economic bankruptcy of Europe, that all of these terrorist groups that we have today are for political reasons and not religious reasons but hey it's under the banner of Islam the Ku Klux Klan is under the banner of Christianity religion is to blame for all of this and we'd all be at peace of course these people have never read about <laughs> the Marxist revolution they've never read about the Tamil Tigers they've never read about Japanese kamikazes they've never read about the oppression that takes place in so many different parts of the world under a secular regime but you know what? It's all religion to blame. You know what? Fine. What about all of the positives? What about the meaning that it gives to a person's life? What about purpose? Because I, I know for myself, I can say this without any hesitation that if it wasn't for Islam, I would be a miserable creature. I would be a miserable human being. I would have no purpose. And you know what? I would not be able to weather any storm. And you know what James Baldwin said? He said, the man that needs to be feared most in society is someone who has nothing to lose. People that, are ha that have meaningless lives, lives of no purpose, that will inflict meaningless on other people's lives because they can't deal with their own meaningless lives. New town, right? Those types of shootings. What would drive a person? What makes a person so sick to go and murder little children in an elementary school? Meaningless. There's no life. And you know, subhanAllah, when Allah Azawajal says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, istajeebu lillahi wa lirrasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. O oh, you who believe, answer your, the call of your Lord and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if they call you to that which gives you life. Because if you don't have purpose, you don't have life. And you know what? That's why people who have all of the great circumstances for happiness in the world, because people think that happiness means that I can chill and I don't have to do anything, that I live a stress-free life. People equate a lack of stress and a lack of work with happiness, but the opposite is actually true. Because when people have nothing to do, they become miserable. They give themselves work. Because everyone needs to feel productive. You need to feel like you're achieving something meaningful or else life becomes not worth it and so people will take their own lives. So don't, subhanAllah, people think that if I'm not, if I'm not committed to Islam, if I have no commitment, then everything will be okay. You know, man, those atheists, they must be living it up. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to answer to nobody. Number one, there's no such thing as a true atheist. And this is our creed as Ahl Sunnah Wal Jama'ah. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, no such thing as a pure atheist. They all believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those people who need science to confirm Quran and Sunnah, read about the God spot. 
Every single person believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Edward Young, who's a professor in Princeton, who ran lie detector tests on atheists and they all failed their lie detector tests. You know what he said? He said, you wouldn't be arguing with God and you wouldn't be mad at him if you didn't believe in him. You're just mad at him because your dad didn't buy you a PlayStation when you were 13. Right? Something happened in your life and you couldn't, what, you couldn't understand why. And so you decided to tell yourself that nobody knows why. It makes no sense. I'm just going to do whatever I feel like doing. And let me ask you this question. Have you ever met a happy atheist content with Sakina, tranquility? Like, have you ever met a humble atheist before? <laughs> They're always confrontational. They're angry people. Because that void is there. And it can't be filled with other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they're ignoring that. And so that's misery in and of itself. And shaqa, the opposite of sa'ada that the Prophet ﷺ describes, the opposite of happiness is shaqa, means deprivation. Shaqi, deprived. Deprived of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, lahu ma'ishatan dhanka. They have a suffocating lifestyle. Now imagine that person having a meaningless life in and of itself is miserable. Imagine when that person has to deal with a tragedy in their lives. How are they supposed to weather that storm? Seriously. You know, compare the Sahaba who would lose children, lose their legs sometimes, right? A person like Abi Qilaba al Jurmi radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was blind, lost both of his arms, lost both of his legs, and was still always saying Alhamdulillah to Kobe Bryant who rants on Facebook about his torn ACL in his $13 billion mansion or whatever it is. Seriously. And you know, Imam Zaid was just talking about how Islam gives us happiness. It gives us that sense of meaning. It gives us something to live for. It gives us something to keep us going. But then now here's the question. If you look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ, and we need to be honest here. If you look at the life of the Prophet ﷺ and you look at the lives of the companions and the lives of the Salaf, do you necessarily see happy people? How many of you would say that the Prophet ﷺ was happy? Raise your hand. How many of you would say that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was a happy man? Raise your hand. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah ta'ala, let's start with him. You know, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz gave up everything when he became Khalifa. Zahad al dunya, subhanAllah, he, he really gave up everything. Gave up his nice clothes, gave up his 14 palaces, gave up the jewelry in his house, gave up everything. Before that, he was a very happy person on the outside. Very happy go lucky, very joyful, always, always had a smile on his face. And then subhanAllah, when he becomes Khalifa and he comes close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he abandons all of that. And I want you to listen to this and tell me if this sounds like happiness. His wife, Fatima, she says that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, used to, he didn't used to pray a lot of Qiyam al he just used to pray two rak'ahs. He did not surpass anyone with many rak'ahs of Qiyam al -Layl. But it was just two special rak'ahs that he would pray every night. But she said, you know what? There was a verse that I was afraid he would read. And she said, listen, this wife, would, she said, I would make dua to Allah that he would not come across this ayah. Because if he read this ayah, I thought that I would wake up the next day a widow and the ummah would wake up without its khalifa. She said he was like a bird that was being splashed with water, meaning he would panic when he would come across this ayah. And so I hoped that I would never see him read this ayah. Because when he read it, I thought he was going to die. Because of how much he would weep. And how much, it, how much it pained him. You know what that ayah was? It wasn't even a full ayah. It was part of an ayah. Surah Ashura, the beginning of Surah Ashura. Fariqun fil jannah wa fariqun fil sa'ir. A group in paradise and a group in hellfire. Can you imagine? His wife says, I thought he was going to die when he would read that. Why? Because he feared that he might be fariqun fi sa'ir. He might be from the group of the people in hellfire. And he would cry. And he would panic. And I thought he would die. Now if you look at that, you say, wait a minute, Islam is supposed to give me happiness. Islam is supposed to give me tranquility. What happened? 
fast. And, and you know, the Qur'an is supposed to make a person feel good. Why is it making him feel this way? Why is that ayah having that effect on him? And you know what? Fast forward to the end of his life. As Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is dying, and he says to his wife and children, as he kisses them for the last time, to leave the room. And as they leave the room, they peek into that room. And they see him laying there, and his face illuminates. And you know, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was afraid of how he would die. He told Raja ibn Haywa when he was dying, rahimahullah, he said, when you receive my body in the grave, I want you to be the one that's standing in the grave to receive my body, and I want you to uncover my face. If you see it facing the Qibla, then say Alhamdulillah, because Allah has forgiven me. If you see it otherwise, then ask the people to forget, to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me, because I'm in a turbulent situation. So he was afraid. And as he sends his family out, they look inside and they peek, and they see his face illuminate. And he has a big smile on his face. And you know what he says? He says, Marhaban bihadihi wujuh. Greetings to these beautiful faces. Allati laysat bi wujuhi insun wala jan. These faces that don't belong to jinn or human beings. And you know what he recited? He said, Tilka darul akhirah. Naj'aluha lilladheena la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wa la fasada. This is paradise. This is the home of paradise. We grant it to those who don't seek status in this world nor corruption. And truly, victory belongs to the believers. SubhanAllah. That same Quran that would cause him to stand up and cry at night. That same Quran that would cause him to panic to a point that his wife thought he would die. Because he didn't know. He wasn't sure of himself, is the same Qur'an that comforted him in his last moments. Now what about the Prophet ﷺ? Because that doesn't sound like a happy life. He didn't live a very happy life then. What happened? Look at the Prophet ﷺ. And you know really, what's necessary is that when we read the life of the Prophet ﷺ, as a person who loves Rasulullah ﷺ, how does it make you feel when you read about the moments in Ta'if? How does it make you feel about the moments when he's, when he's describing the worst day of his life وسلم, The blood running down his body, the people yelling profanities at him, feeling a sense of rejection, calling upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all alone. How does it make you feel when you read about the Prophet wasalam's neck being stepped on? How does it make you feel when you read about the Prophet wasalam being spit on? How does it make you feel when you read about the Prophet wasalam have, having Uqbah bin Abi Mu'it placing camel guts on his back and his daughter having to come and clean his back while he's shivering alayhi salatu wasalam and saying, don't cry, oh my daughter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support your father. Don't worry about it. If you love the Prophet ﷺ, when you read those, that should move you. But you know what? I think we fail to do the other part too. It's, it necessitates sadness when you read about the sad moments of the Prophet ﷺ. But it also necessitates happiness when you read about the happy moments of the Prophet ﷺ. You know what the most emotional part of the seerah is for me? And wallahi, I'm not joking with you. This is the most emotional part of the seerah for me is the last day of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. When Rasulullah ﷺ, as Anas says, on his last day, that Monday, as he's in his apartment, and the Sahaba are praying Salah. And Anas says that the Prophet ﷺ removed the curtain and was watching us pray. Rasulullah was looking at us pray. And he says about the Prophet وسلم, as he saw us praying, he says, فَكَانَ وَجْهَهُ That verily his face was وَرَقَةُ Mushaf. It was, you know, the Prophet smile was already as bright as the moon as Anas anhu describes him. But he says in those moments, the Prophet وسلم, his face was as bright as a page of the Mus'haf. And he says, فَتَبَسَّمَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ ضَاحِكًا 
He said the Prophet ﷺ smiled and he laughed alayhi salatu wasalam. Can you imagine how the Prophet ﷺ felt? 23 years of blood, sweat and tears. 23 years of rejection. 23 years of فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ You're going to kill yourself over their fate. 23 years of being rejected. 23 years of being physically beaten. 23 years of being emotionally driven to the ground وسلم, from all of the people's concerns. 23 years of never saying no to anybody. 23 years of trying to establish this deen. And the Prophet وسلم, is looking at the Sahaba praying. I love the Prophet وسلم, and I'm happy for him. Wallahi, I read that and I'm happy for him. Because I imagine if I was the Prophet وسلم, looking out at the fruit of my effort. Here it is. Here's what it yielded. Here is your ummah praying, accepting your call. And Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that, <clears throat> he says, we looked to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we were excited. The Sahaba couldn't even pray anymore because they saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam smiling at them and they wanted him to come. And he said, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu also, in the middle of his salah, Abu Bakr moved back because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had come the day before and he prayed with Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So Abu Bakr moved back thinking that maybe this time he's coming back out again sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Anas anhu says the Prophet ﷺ signaled with his right hand to keep praying. And he drew the curtain on himself again alayhi salatu wasalam. And Anas anhu says, I never saw his face again. That was the last time I saw his face. Smiling, happy, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, pleased with his ummah, seeing the fruit of his effort. I read that and I'm happy for the Prophet ﷺ. I'm like, I'm so glad he got to see that before he left this world, sallallahu alayhi wa And that's when he says, sallallahu alayhi wa I want a rafiq al-a'la. I just want the highest companionship. I achieved everything I wanted to achieve here. But what about all of the moments that he suffered before? You know what? That one moment makes it so worth it, doesn't it? That one moment makes it so worth it and takes away everything, everything that came before it. And then I quote to you, understanding now happiness, and I'm going to shock you with these words. Eleanor Roosevelt, you know what she says? She says happiness should not be a goal. Happiness is not a goal. She says it's a byproduct of a life well lived. Happiness is not a goal. It's a byproduct of a life well lived. As Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he said, if the kings knew the joy that we were in, if they knew how happy we were, he said the kings would send their armies to sanction us to try to take it from us. And he was rich before radiallahu anhu rahimahullah. But he said, if they knew how happy we were and how much joy we had, because as Ata rahimahullah said, and my time is up, I'm sorry. As Ata rahimahullah said, that a good deed yields three moments of happiness. When you do the good deed, you feel good. Did you ever feel bad after praying Fajr? <laughs> or doing some da'wah or doing some relief work? When you do the good deed, every time you look back and you remember it. Imam Siraj, how sweet is it every time you look back at the origins of Masjid Taqwa? When you reflect on that. When you look back on it. And then he said, and the greatest joy is when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dear brothers and sisters, happiness is a disposition. It's not circumstantial. I want to introduce to you one of the greatest inspirations of my life. Someone that I love dearly. In 2006, I remember my father-in-law, as he was the Imam in Baton Rouge, getting a phone call that a young man from our community, had pa he was passing away. And we needed to make the janazah arrangements. Young man was riding his motorcycle on his way home. And he was dying and he was done for. And the doctor said, we don't even think he'll make it till tomorrow. Go ahead and prepare his janazah. And the doctor said, it's over. There's no hope in this person anymore. Go ahead and just prepare the funeral. And the parents said, no, never. We're not giving up. Keep him on the machines. 
They said, we'll have to amputate this, we'll have to amputate that. She said, go ahead, but I want my son. I want him alive. No, keep him, keep him. And so the entire community used to visit this brother and make dua for him. And he was in a coma for a very long time. And then that brother woke up a few weeks later, not remembering anything that happened, but all of a sudden with his legs amputated. And we used to visit, I used to visit that brother every single day, every day when I lived in Louisiana. Because I was so inspired by how happy he was to be alive. And how this was the turning point in his life towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, that brother is here today. One of my, my close friends and one of my inspirations, brother Shu'aib. And I'm going to let him say a few words inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for that introduction, Imam Umar. Uh, like, like the Imam uh, Sheikh said, uh, he was one of the most regular visitors at the Masjid, Alhamdulillah, as was his father in law, uh, Abu Abid, inshallah. May Allah uh, grant him the highest levels in Jannah, inshallah. He is, uh, subhanAllah. He is, I don't know why I'm talking about him in the past tense, subhanAllah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, close, inshallah. Um, Inshallah. Uh, so this was about seven years ago, and when I woke up from my coma, uh, I had no idea what was going on. And the nurse comes in a couple days later, and she says that, yeah, we had to cut off your legs. And the first response from my mouth was, Alhamdulillah. Because uh, I was glad to be awake at that point. And uh, over the past seven years, you know, I had lost everything. Uh, when I read the doctor's reports, I found out that... Uh, at one point, during surgeries, my heart had stopped. And alhamdulillah, the doctor picked up my heart with his gloved hands, and he massaged it. And alhamdulillah, with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it started kicking again. Alhamdulillah. Uh, and these past seven years have been recovery slowly and steadily. Uh, there was a point when I couldn't move my fingers. I couldn't move my lips. Uh, and alhamdulillah, gradually things have come back. When I decided to go back to school, uh, the brothers from the local community from Ikna Relief, they stepped up and they bought me a laptop with voice recognition software, alhamdulillah. Uh, I started back with school, I did that for a little bit, and I was, like the Imam said, uh, you know, happiness comes through serving the communities, and life wasn't enough. I wanted to go out and do what I can, alhamdulillah. And I started off with the hunger prevention programs, whenever the sisters in the local community would prepare the food, uh, I, the least I could do was, uh, Ikhna Relief helped me get the minivan also. So I would uh, drive the food around and deliver that to people's uh, houses. SubhanAllah. Now, seven years later, I drove all the way from Louisiana here. Alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar. Alhamdulillah. Uh, this year, I've also started playing wheelchair tennis. And uh, like the Sheikh was saying, that happiness... Uh, you know, is, is a disposition. My coach says something very similar also, that to win a point in tennis, the first opponent you have is the net. It's only three and a half feet high, but the first thing you have to do is mentally prepare yourself that, no, I can hit the ball over the net. If you can't get it over the net, if you can't if you believe that you can, then you're not going to get the point and not going to get any further. Alhamdulillah. But uh, uh, this is uh, just a few words, inshallah. And uh, hopefully, uh, I, we can have better recoveries and serve the community better and better and better, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. Kapir. Do you need help right now? 